In the human body, blood vessels are essential. When they fail to function properly, overall health is compromised. For Starship, fuel lines serve the same critical role. They act as the vehicle's blood vessels, forming a system that is extraordinarily complex and absolutely vital to successful operation. Unlike the human body, however, Starship's internal systems can be redesigned and improved with far greater flexibility. They can be refined proactively to perform better with each new iteration. With this understanding, SpaceX continues to implement upgrades across the Starship program, including the Booster V3 and likely the ship as well, as the company sets its sights on increasingly ambitious objectives. So how exactly is the V3 Starship fuel system being upgraded? Let's explore that question in today's episode of Great SpaceX. When discussing Super Heavy V3, it is clear that this version introduces several groundbreaking upgrades. These include a new hot staging design, a revised grid fin configuration, and an updated engine variant. From a fuel perspective, SpaceX has also announced a new fuel transfer tube designed to further improve efficiency and reliability during a wide range of maneuvers. However, upgrades do not stop there, especially following the issues encountered with B-18. That explosion occurred within the liquid oxygen tank, an area known for its dense and complex fuel line network. This raises an important question. Beyond the upgrades already mentioned, what other changes have been made to the fuel system? Let's begin with the tanks. First is the liquid oxygen landing tank, a component we have already seen SpaceX install during the final stacking phase of booster assembly. This tank will experience a slight positional change, moving closer to the quick disconnect system, which also places it nearer to the liquid oxygen refueling point. This adjustment likely improves fuel pumping efficiency while also simplifying connections. More importantly, this landing tank will now include structural support struts designed to maintain stability during flight. These supports address concerns related to in-flight vibrations which could otherwise cause the landing tank to shift or collide with surrounding structures. Such collisions could lead to cracks, structural failure, leaks, or even explosions. In addition, the landing tank appears to be connected to composite overwrapped pressure vessels around a pipe located at the top of the tank. SpaceX ultimately intends to use autogenous pressurization to pressurize the landing tank. This system relies on hot gases from the engines themselves, eliminating the need for helium stored in pressure vessels and allowing the vehicle to make more efficient use of its onboard resources. However, in these early versions, the landing tanks still appear to rely on pressure vessels to assist with pressurization. It's likely that future prototypes will transition fully to autogenous pressurization once the system proves sufficiently stable. As a result, composite overwrapped pressure vessels will continue to play a prominent role in upcoming flights. Beyond pressurizing the landing tank, these vessels serve multiple purposes. They store high-pressure gases such as helium, which supports the spin start of Raptor turbo pumps. They also store nitrogen for the reaction control system, which helps steer the vehicle. Additionally, they are installed throughout the booster to support structural and landing-related functions. In V3, these pressure vessels have received a visible upgrade, featuring a more durable and robust outer shell. These upgraded vessels can be seen in the orange-red units inside Star Factory, in images of B-19 inside Mega Bay, and in recent footage showing them transported to Massey for testing. Now, let us look at the bottom of the liquid oxygen landing tank. This is where the landing tank connects directly to the engines. Because the landing phase relies on thrust from the inner and middle engine rings, there will be 13 individual pipes connecting the landing tank to 13 engines. Unlike previous versions, which used a single manifold to feed multiple engines, this design uses separate pipes for each engine. This significantly improves reliability. If one pipe were to fail, the remaining engines could, could continue operating, rather than all engines being affected simultaneously by a manifold failure. This design philosophy mirrors SpaceX's broader engine strategy. Earlier rockets relied on a small number of very large engines. SpaceX instead uses a larger number of smaller engines. While a single Raptor engine is less powerful than the historic F-1 engine, 33 Raptors together produce far greater total thrust than 5 F-1 engines. Just as importantly, this approach improves fault tolerance. If one or two engines fail, the vehicle can still operate efficiently. In contrast, older rockets suffered immediate and severe performance loss if even a single engine failed 
due to the high concentration of each engine to total thrust. Earlier, we noted that the liquid oxygen landing tank will be positioned closer to the QD point. This naturally leads to another question. How will these components be connected? The answer is through a large dedicated pipe. This pipe is separate from the one used to load the main liquid oxygen tank. This configuration differs from the methane system, which uses only a single pipe. The likely reason is that the liquid oxygen main tank and landing tank are fully separate, whereas the two methane tanks are connected through an intermediate transfer tube. That covers the liquid oxygen landing tank. Now, let's turn to the methane landing tank. Similar to the liquid oxygen tank, the methane landing tank will connect each engine individually. In this case, there will be 33 separate pipes feeding the engines. This again reduces the risk of localized failures. Because the methane landing tank is centrally located rather than offset, the piping layout will be more symmetrical and orderly. Additionally, these pipes will include valves and filtration systems at their ends. These components are designed to prevent sediment, ice, or debris from entering the engines, which could result from frozen fuel or structural damage. Filtration ensures that the fuel reaching the engines remains in optimal condition. The inclusion of valves also gives SpaceX greater control. If an issue arises or if a specialized landing maneuver is required, individual engines can be shut down by closing specific fuel lines. In terms of pressurization, the methane landing tank, like its liquid oxygen counterpart, is connected to a COPV to assist with maintaining proper pressure. Earlier, we briefly mentioned the intermediate pipe connecting the methane header tank and the methane landing tank. This component is the upgraded fuel transfer tube referenced at the beginning of the discussion. This tube is significantly larger than previous versions, measuring approximately 37 meters in length and 3 meters in diameter. When first observed, it was frequently compared in size to the Falcon 9. While slightly smaller, it remains enormous and effectively acts as the structural backbone of the Super Heavy booster. This transfer tube sits between the two tanks, connecting the bottom of the main methane tank to the top of the landing tank. SpaceX has stated that this design enables faster and more reliable flip maneuvers, as well as the ability to start multiple engines simultaneously. So far, most observations have focused on the exterior of this tube. The interior is just as important. Due to its size, internal bracing bars have been added to reinforce the structure and improve stability. Evidence from the B-18 test suggests that even though external damage appeared severe, the fuel transfer tube itself remained in relatively good condition. However, the presence of numerous internal braces introduces new considerations. These structures increase the risk of debris generation, sediment accumulation, or frost buildup. This is one of the reasons why the smaller pipes connecting the landing tank to the engines require robust filtration systems and valves. Finally, we arrive at the systems closest to the engines. As previously mentioned, only 13 engines in the inner and middle rings are active during landing. These engines require several additional systems to function properly during this critical phase. Beyond fuel lines, each engine is connected to electrical and data lines that route back to a central control system located outside the booster. The electrical systems are responsible for power delivery, while the data systems handle navigation, pressure monitoring, temperature sensing, and other critical parameters. This data allows SpaceX to make continuous adjustments during flight. During landing, the inner and middle ring engines must constantly adjust thrust to slow the booster and guide it precisely. To accomplish this, each engine is equipped with a thrust vector control system. Above the engine bay, these systems are visible as paired casings. In total, there are 26 casings. Each casing is connected to another through small data tubes, allowing the engines to communicate and coordinate seamlessly during landing. In summary, SpaceX is building an extraordinarily complex internal system within Super Heavy and likely within the ship as well. At first glance, this network of tanks, pipes, valves, and control systems may seem overwhelming. However, when examined piece by piece, each component serves a clear and logical function. If you have additional insights or observations about this system, feel free to share them and join the discussion in the comments. What is clear is that the internal piping system of Super Heavy is undergoing significant improvement, particularly in areas related to landing support. This is directly tied to one of SpaceX's major goals of 2026. This year is intended to mark the first time in aerospace history that a fully reusable launch system becomes operational. Achieving this goal depends heavily on a successful two-stage landing process. 
Although Super Heavy has already completed three successful catches using the Mechazilla arms, SpaceX continues to pursue further optimization. This includes active flip maneuvers, landings at higher angles of attack, and landings using fewer engines. Flights 9, 10, and 11 suggest that these maneuvers remain challenging and their outcomes have understandably raised concerns. Upgrades to fuel lines, electrical systems, data connections, and related infrastructure promise improved landing performance, specifically during complex maneuvers. More importantly, after continued ocean landing tests, future boosters are expected to return to land and be reused through Mechazilla arm catches. This process demands extreme precision and reliability. Similar upgrades are also expected for the ship. Compared to Super Heavy, landing the ship presents an even greater challenge. The ship travels much farther, completing a full orbit around Earth before returning to Starbase from the opposite direction. During ascent, it must pass through the atmosphere to reach orbit, a phase that has already revealed vulnerabilities. Early V2 flights in 2025 consistently encountered ascent issues, many of which many of which were related to pipeline systems. Once in orbit, the ship must perform a variety of mission tasks. However, the most demanding phase remains re-entry. During this stage, the vehicle experiences intense heat and pressure due to atmospheric friction. While upgraded piping has limited impact during peak heating, its importance becomes critical during landing. After surviving re-entry, the engines and control surfaces must work together to decelerate and guide the ship safely to the ground. At this point, the upgraded piping system must operate with absolute accuracy and reliability. Current expectations suggest that this milestone could be reached in the first half of this year, potentially around Flight 15. The goal is close. In the end, the piping system, the true blood vessels of Starship, plays a central role in enabling the vehicle's extraordinary capabilities. These systems are continuously refined and improved. While the outlook is promising, only real-world flight results will determine success. For now, all we can do is watch closely and wait. And with that, folks, this has been Kevin with Great SpaceX. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe if you haven't already to stay up to date with yours truly on the latest milestones in SpaceX's journey. Thank you so much for watching, and always remember, curiosity, imagination, and inspiration will follow you so long as you keep looking up.